Good afternoon, everybody. Last session of the day. We're in a fairly tight room for a lot of people here. Um, this is the traditional Drupal security team panel, which typically does not get this type of attendance. Um, and also the Drupal 7 end of life announcement, which I'm guessing is what most people are in the room for. Uh, oh, good. Tim, welcome. Um, <laughs> and Narayan, welcome. Uh, so we're going to start off with a, uh, an introduction to the security team members that are up here. Tim is actually the CTO of the Drupal Association. He's not a security team member, but he has some slides that he's responsible for, and I'm glad he made it. Um, so security team members, your name and your pronouns. My name is Michael Hess. I go by he, him, his. Uh, and my favorite vulnerability uh, is an old... What? <laughs> Not everybody has a favorite vulnerability. This isn't just something you introduce yourself with when you're in casual conversations. Um, recently, I've been going with injection, but not like SQL injection or even LDAP injection, old school injection. Anybody remember what the first like mass use of injection as a vulnerability was that like people actually exploited? Most of the time without knowing what it was, I'll give everybody a hint, 2600. Payphones. No, it's payphones. Yeah. Uh, you could play recorded uh, tones into a phone, and it would record that as money being deposited. It was an injection based on the switching fabric that didn't quite know what was going on. Uh, and my favorite breakfast food is French toast. Benji. Hi, Benji Fisher. My pronouns are he, him, his, but if you call me they, them, that's fine with me, too. Uh, my favorite breakfast food is grape nuts with yogurt. My favorite vulnerability was Drupal Geddon because it happened fairly early in my Drupal career and I did patch my site in time. <laughs> uh, my name is Jess. I'm XJM on Drupal.org. My favorite breakfast food is probably eggs over medium. Um, I'm an overlap of vegetarian, so that's how I get a lot of my protein. And uh, my favorite vulnerability. Not a vulnerability per se, but I'm going to say left pad because it got people to start reducing the size of their NPM uh, builds. <laughs> so that's today's choice. Hmm. Hey, I'm Peter. Uh, I guess favorite but not daily breakfast food would be pancakes, uh, you know, with chocolate chips or bananas or something. Um, favorite vulnerability, one that a colleague pointed out recently in a local government site where they're using an API that lets you for some reason, pass in the endpoint. So uh, if you wanted to, you could pass in your own website, and it would pass in their Twitter credentials, and then you could take over their Twitter account. And apparently, it, for six months, he's been calling and them at every number available, and they just ignore him. So. So very soon, a certain prominent Twitter account. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that prominent. It's local government. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy Thays. Uh, my, uh, uh, my pronouns are she, her, or they, them. Oh, wait, I forgot. I'm a he, him. Oh, here. Oh, and I'm a he, him, Peter. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> uh, let's see. My favorite breakfast food is burritos, especially um, when I wrap them and then fry them in the cast iron pan after making them. It makes them extra special good. Uh, my favorite vulnerability is uh, multiple types of information disclosures because usually it's like, oh, is that really a security vulnerability or is it not? And it leads to some interesting conversations. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so what's the Drupal security team? We are a group of individuals who work to improve the security of the Drupal project. Uh, I'll get to what that work looks like in a second, but we are made up of individuals from around the world uh, working at a variety of different types of organizations. Uh, and some of the uh, credit we have for this comes from these organizations. Security advisories like issues get issue credit assigned. That issue credit is often tied back to organizations. And so this is our, uh, this is the organizations tied back to them. So we often get questions like, what does the security team do? And I'm going to apologize in advance. There's a lot of slides to get through, so I'm going to go a little fast and save time for Q&A at the end. Um, what does the security team do? Mostly, we coordinate this process known as coordinated disclosure to help keep Drupal secure. You are familiar with the output of that process. 
that are those Wednesday's emails or the Twitter notifications that, we, that you see. Um, we also assist or provide support with Drupal-related security initiatives. Uh, we coordinate with other open source security teams. We act as that point of contact into the project. Um, we do educational events related to security, such as what we're doing right now. Uh, we work with third parties that might be interested in helping core maintain security. We monitor trends around hacked sites, and we triage security research reports. Now, obviously when we talk about what we do do, sometimes we have to talk about what we don't do. We don't proactively search for vulnerabilities in core. In other words, we do not sit down and you know, check out a Git repo at random and go through line by line and look for vulnerabilities as part of the security team's formal duties. We do have team members that actually do do that work, but it's not a formal task that we set out. And we don't help fix individual compromised sites. So you know, we, if you reach out, if your site gets compromised, we, we don't help you with that. We, we may point you to a vendor or the marketplace rankings to find someone to help you fix that, but we don't do it. We do keep track of them because we're interested in looking at trends, especially right after the release of a large vulnerability. Um, coordinated disclosure is the process that we internally follow to release security issues. And so, you know, it's really easy to read those Wednesday emails and be like, yep, that's easy. There's a lot, and I mean a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to release those Wednesday emails. Um, and so, you know, coordinated disclosure, here's a flow diagram of it. I apologize for those in the back. This is a little small. But effectively, a vulnerability gets reported to the security team. We do some initial triage on the vulnerability to make sure it's a valid vulnerability. You know, if a user, if a security researcher reports that logged in as UID 1, they can use full HTML as an input filter and then execute JavaScript. We don't consider that to be a vulnerability. Um, but assuming it is a valid vulnerability, we work with the maintainer of that code package to work on fixing the vulnerability. This is typically a back and forth. Um, eventually, the maintainer gets a fix. Somebody's reviewed the fix and make sure that it looks sane. And then we set a release date and uh, draft the security advisory, and then you get your Wednesday emails. There's more to it than this, but this is a overview of what this happens. And then hopefully you get those Wednesday emails, and if you're running the effective code, you stop and upgrade to the new version so that you can maintain security. The easiest thing to do to help keep yourself secure, like the lowest, easiest like barrier, is to make sure you're running current supported code. Um, that brings us to our next topic, which is Drupal Stewart. So, Tim. Oh, my goodness, I get a fancy remote. I don't know if it works. <laughs> Here, I'm going to pop up to the remote, or to the mic. So, Drupal Stewart is a product, or really a service, that comes from the Drupal Association that helps provide a little bit of peace of mind and an extra kind of bandwidth for you as a site owner uh, to manage uh, security updates uh, for your site. So. Uh, what is it? It's a web application firewall product. So if there's a known vulnerability, a serious vulnerability coming up, it's highly critical, it might be mass exploitable. Um, before that vulnerability is disclosed and the update is released, we enable firewall rules to help protect it from being exploited. So this is available for customers of the program directly or major partners, hosting platform companies like Acquia and Pantheon, for example. Um, that are part of the program and can protect their constituent sites in the same way. Um, if you're not totally familiar with what a web application firewall is doing, um, basically we are not updating your site. We are not patching anything. We are looking for the like formula of a request that is inbound and if it matches certain attributes that would trigger an exploit, we are blocking those requests before they hit your server. Um, so this is what's closing this gap between when that release happens on Wednesday and when you're like, well, I'm in Australia, I got that email at 3 a.m. Um, and I'm on holiday and I just don't have time to do this right now. If it's covered by Drupal Steward, you can say, I'm going to choose to do that update at nine in the morning on my next business day because you're covered in this gap until you update. Um, so this is particularly helpful also if you are at an academic institution perhaps who manages like a thousand sites um, and coordinating the update of doing all of those in like a couple of hours is difficult for you. 
There are some limitations though, so it'll only apply to these highly critical core vulnerabilities. Sometimes we might choose to provide coverage for something like less severe in part just to exercise the, the system, um, make sure it's working. And there also might be kinds of vulnerabilities that just can't be protected using a web application firewall rule. Um, it's also possible that the, the rule the request is blocking might have false positives, might block some legitimate traffic in certain cases, and that's something we look out for. So to run through this very quickly, the way we decide when we deploy this program is the security team identifies as a vulnerability that they think is mass exploitable. Uh, we decide whether it can be mitigated with a WAF, and then in the PSA, we indicate either yes, it will be covered by the Drupal Steward program, or no, it's not something we can cover. Um, from there, we communicate that with our partners, and we try and in, uh, enable those rules in a monitor-only mode before it's disclosed to, in part, tell us, is someone already trying to exploit it that we don't know about? Is this actually a zero day and we don't know? Um, and also to check for false positives. Um, so we review these sort of monitor-only logs, and then prior to the actual release day when the vulnerability becomes public, we enforce those web application firewall rules, and the release goes out as normal. Um, so this is not a gate on the security releases. The code is always free and open source remains free. But this is, again, just an extra tool to allow you to schedule when you're responding to these security issues. Um, it is available in three tiers. You can purchase it directly from the Drupal Association. Um, and there's a revenue sharing program to support the work of the security team. Um, there, is a, uh, there is pricing for sort of standard and enterprise sizes. So directly from the Drupal Association, from certain hosting partners, uh, and so on. Um, the partners that are involved in this, they have to sponsor a security team member, they have to be supporting partners of the Drupal Association, and they have to be major contributors. Um, so this is not something that's generically available to any web host. It's something where we work with trusted folks who are deeply involved in building and securing Drupal. So with that, I will hand it back to Michael. Thank you, Tim. So, I think most of you are up here. We've got two upcoming policy announcements that we are making. This is kind of shared as a preview. These are pretty much agreed to. There may be small changes that change between now and when we actually publish these, which will hopefully be sometime later this week. But this is a preview, and while there may be, I don't know, 100 people back there, please don't hold me to this. Um, but it, 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 they're not going to change much. Um, we are changing the security advisories for which we do scope uh, changes for. So right now, pretty much every security advisory, uh, we will publish every vulnerability. And there are some that are an enormous amount of work for us to do internally. And the use case of the actual exploitability of this is low. Uh, information disclosure is a great example. Um, I'll give an example, an, an actual real world example here. Uh, you have a website, it allows comments on nodes. Um, Comments are placed, and a node gets unpublished for some reason. So this content is now unavailable, but you have a role at your organization that's designed to review comments. They can still see the comments that were left on that entity prior to it being unpublished, and they can see the entity title. But they shouldn't be able to because the entity is unpublished and they don't have permission to do that. That is technically information disclosure. The risk is very low. Previously, we would have debated about fixing that publicly, we are going to start moving that just, I'm sorry, debated about fixing it publicly and probably might have gone either way. The policy change here is we are going to end up calling these bugs and fixing them in uh, public and releasing them publicly. Um, denial of service is another example here. Uh, denial of service is one of these things that, you know, yes, there are some examples that are egregious, but for the most part, you can fill a database log or some other resource consumed entity by doing something repeatedly. Um, you know, there, you know, an example of here is something that generates, any, you know, 25 watchdog events when you see a single, uh, uh, when you visit a single page and watchdog is going to the database, not to syslog, which gets rotated over, and you could, in theory, fill the database. We're going to end up taking, we do take most of these public now, and we're just codifying this as these are going to become public. Um, there's going to be a couple others that probably get added to this as examples, but the low, uh, the, 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 the complexity required to exploit and the risks to the individual sites are really what we're aiming here. Is it worth us spending the time to fix these in uh, private or should we make them public and get more eyes on them? 
Um, so that's the upcoming policy change. And now onto the larger one. How many people are here to hear about this topic? Okay, so <laughs> let's start with a little bit of a history lesson here. Um, Drupal 7 development started in July of 2008. The first alpha came out in February of 2010, and Drupal 7.0 was cut on January 5th of 2011. Also in 2011, Google Plus was invite only. It was going to replace Facebook as the most interesting, best social network ever. Facebook actually came out with its timeline view, which was innovative and disruptive at the time. The Mac App Store came online. We were running IE9 which is still better than IE6, and Android 3.1, and Microsoft Zune was finally shut down. Who know, whoever had a Zune? Anybody? Yeah, OK. So <laughs> we've, and some people like their Zoom. So we have gone back and forth with this. As, as I'm sure all of you know, we have done extensions. We did the first extension during COVID. We did another extension. We went to a model where we would default to announcing if there was going to be an extension or not, as opposed to just announcing the extension. We've gone back and forth with the way we've handled this. And honestly, it's been, it, it's, it's, you know, there's, every time there's a lot of communication. And I think we've reached the point where we are finally going to end of life Drupal 7. And there's a date. And we won't change the date. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we are finally going to end of life Drupal 7 on January 5th, 2025. That is effectively a year and two month extension from the previous end of life. The previous end of life, I'm sorry? From the previous extension, yeah. So it was supposed to be ended in 2023. We're bumping it a year and a few months. You'll notice the January 5th date lines up with the birthday of Drupal 7. And so that's, that's not the full reason why we're doing it that way, but that's what one of the things that, you know, just a nice uh, 14th, anniversary. 14th anniversary. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be clear here. There will be no further extensions. This is it. We're done. You're not going to see a PSA from us in July of next year being like, just kidding, everybody. Two more years. No, it's over, um, which means it's time to migrate. It's now time, you know, if you're, if you're an organization like, like mine is, I work for the University of Michigan, oh, it's been extended, we'll just ride out the extension. Oh, it's been extended, we'll ride out the extension. I'm assuming other people have been doing this too, by show of hands. Yeah, so the, the, the train is coming to an end. It is time to migrate. Now, some of you may be facing a lot of work to do this migration. Um, a lot of work. And some of you may be dreading that. We have some assistance for this. Uh, I'm going to ask Tim to come back up and talk about it. Yeah, so uh, the Drupal Association is going to try and put together a resource library for all of you folks who are still on Drupal 7, who still have properties to migrate. That includes us. Drupal.org is still largely Drupal 7. So we understand the situation you're in and what you're working to do. Let me make that very clear. Um, a big part of this, in addition to just being a resource library, documentation, materials, is we're going to feature certified migration partners. So these are people who are uh, contributors, partners of the Drupal Association, and who are well qualified to help you with your migration needs, to help you get from Drupal 7 to wherever you need to go. Um, if you are out there and you're part of the agency audience and you're interested in being part of this, you're already a certified partner of the Drupal Association or you're already working on that process, um, or you're excited to get started, we'd certainly love to have a conversation with you. Uh, those partners will be paying a percentage of deal sizes to support the Drupal Association uh, and to support the work of the security team because we need to make it financially responsible and, and feasible to put in the investment in, in making this happen. Um, so if you're interested in becoming a partner, a migration partner, rather than being one of the end users, uh, you can reach out to us at partnerships at association.drupal.org. And if you are one of those Drupal 7 site owners, you can look for this resource library to be published soon on drupal.org. Um, and uh, we'll be reaching out with communications throughout this 18-month window following DrupalCon uh, that folks have to get to their next solution. And, and I'll add on to this. Um, if you are an agency that is interested in doing site upgrades, please reach out to this email address and become a partner. Um, and if you are a site owner, please consider using one of the agencies that are on this list. 
it helps the entire ecosystem get better by doing this. So please support us, supporting you by with the extension and uh, go through this process. We will end up with some marketing material on this and some pages listing the partners. Um, but in the end, we want you to migrate. Like that's the bottom line. We're putting this list together to help all of you migrate. We're also putting it together to help us because there is a revenue sharing here, but you need to migrate. Um, Drupal 7 is closing its doors. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so go someplace else. Obviously, going to Drupal 10 would be our first choice. Going to another open source content management system is also an option here. Taking your Drupal site and just making it a static website. Um, you know, I know that as I was going through my site audits, I'm looking here and some of these content pages haven't been updated in several years. And it's like, I could just turn this into static HTML. Software as a service or taking the site down, um, which reduces all the technical support that comes with that. Um, there are some upcoming changes to Drupal 7 before end of life. And so as that 18 months is in the future, um, there are some things that we are doing to start changing the ecosystem slightly to encourage end of life. So probably the big one here is unsupported contributed modules. If you go back to that original slide I had where we talked about the coordinated disclosure process, the second step in that process is the security team contacts the module owner and says, hey, is this a valid issue? Work with us. There's a whole escalating thing that happens there where you know we ask them, we ask them, we send them emails. We will, if they're working for an agency, sometimes we'll send the agency emails, but eventually if the maintainer doesn't respond, we mark the module itself unsupported. What typically happens is people will come forward and be like, uh, I use this, can, can I be the maintainer? And I use this, can I be the maintainer? And so then we have to go through the process of marking the module not unsupported. <laughs> Um, this is time consuming. And so for Drupal 7, specifically and only Drupal 7, we're not going to do this. If we mark a module unsupported for Drupal 7, it's done. It, it will remain unsupported through the end of life, which it would then be marked supported for. Anyhow, what does this mean? If you want, if you've got a Drupal 7 module that you use heavily in your sites, apply to become the maintainer now. I'll pause for you all to do that. Um, <laughs> Uh, so apply to become the maintainer now, and then you'll be added to that list of people who we contact and we don't have to go through unsupporting. It saves us time, it saves you time, it, it, it's a win for everything. You do not have to maintain Drupal 10 branches. You can apply to be a maintainer solely of the Drupal 7 branches. Um, this policy does not apply to Drupal 10 uh, modules with Drupal 10 or greater than seven releases. Uh, Moderately critical issues in Drupal 7 alone, we will have less support for them, meaning that a non-mass exploitable, moderately critical issue, uh, even if it impacts a future dated version of Drupal, may not get fixed in Drupal 10, depending on how that risk score, I'm sorry, Drupal 7, thank you. <laughs> depending on how that risk score, uh, how that risk score pans out for Drupal 7. So there may be an instance where we fix something in Drupal 10, and we do not fix it in Drupal 7 based on the differentiating risk scores. Um, PHP and MySQL versions. So effective July 1, we are only going to issue patches for PHP 5, 6, and above. Um, Drupal 7 supports, I think it's 5.2? I think it's 5.2, and there's no test spots for 5.2, which is a whole other problem. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to bump, effectively bump the minimum required version for Drupal 7 to PHP 5.6. We may, before end of life, bump that to a higher version of PHP. I want to point out here that, Drupal, that PHP 5.6 and PHP 7 are both end of life. And yes, there are vendors who may provide support for them, but they are technically end of life products. Windows support. Windows only security issues will no longer be patched. Um, so if there is a issue that is only an issue on Windows, uh, we, we may not patch it. We, now, sure if one of you is very sad. Yeah, may, maybe one of you. I do know there are some organizations out there that have requirements against running not Windows operating systems. And that's how you end up hosting a Drupal site on IIS. Um, 
you, unlike when Drupal first came out, Drupal 7 first came out, we now have Docker. Docker can host your Drupal site on your Windows server, so there are ways around this. Um, as mentioned earlier, Drupal is kind of getting old. There's a lot of third-party libraries out there. Um, a lot of third-party libraries out there that where they may say, hey, we're not going to support this, or, yeah, we support this library, but only if you're running PHP 8 which obviously is not a requirement for Drupal 7. So we may end up having to uh, mark some third-party modules as, as, as unsupported based on their dependencies on third-party libraries. Earlier you heard Tim talk about Drupal Stewart. Um, Drupal Stewart is, uh, we may post EOL, we may, they're, they're, it's in bold, may choose to extend Drupal 7 Drupal Stewart rules to our Drupal Stewart partners. May, that's not a final decision yet, but it's easy enough for us to do it in certain circumstances, and it's, it's quick, but that's a DA and security team decision and likely gets evaluated on the release itself. Now, as of right now, today, there are no vendor support plans after EOL. Uh, so, what's EOL, end of life? Um, running, uh, software past its end of life is risky. This is not just Drupal, this applies to all end of life software. I just saw a machine in this building running Windows, I think it was 98, end of life. <laughs> uh, what happens? The security team no longer provides coordination for end of life. Um, most enterprises won't allow end of life so, uh, systems to run. Security frameworks don't allow it. Uh, within Drupal specifically, what may happen? Well, at some point after end of life, Drupal 7 packaging is not going to work. Uh, the Drupal Association has to maintain all the code that does that packaging work, and it's different than modern versions of Drupal, and so at some point those operations will stop. Drupal 7.x uh, branches for all projects will be marked unsupported. Uh, Drupal 7 relies on a bunch of XML data sets that is going to go away in more current versions of Drupal. These XML data sets, you know, you probably don't even know they're there for the most part, but Drush relies on them. So if you've ever done Drush DL module name, that is using that XML data set, and that will likely go away sometime after end of life. Um, obviously, the testing infrastructure for Drupal 7 will be shut off. Uh, Drupal 7 is going to probably get, start getting flagged as insecure based on third-party scans. And Drupal 7 issues that are reported to the security team, even highly critical ones, will be made public uh, with or without a fix. And Drupal 7 sites will be made, will be, uh, will display a message that they're insecure. What doesn't change after Drupal 7's end of life? Anything related to Drupal 10. Nothing is going to change related to Drupal 10, 11, etc. And the Git repositories that have that Drupal 7 code, they're not going anywhere. Okay. If you are not in the room and you're watching this on a recording, you can email us questions at security at drupal.org and we will be happy to answer them. But for all of you who are physically in this room, I got through my slides uh, and we have time for questions and answers. Okay, so um, we don't have a microphone in this room, so I'm gonna try my best to uh, repeat the question. Uh, I saw your hand go up first. So right now, Wait, the question. Question. I'm sorry, thank you, thank you. Um, so the question was, <laughs> uh, how will Drupal 7 indicate that it's insecure after end of life? What mechanism is going to be used to do that? And does anybody want to take this? It's all you, Michael. Okay. Um, <laughs> so right now, Drupal 7, and we did this with Drupal 6. Yeah. Every time Drupal 7 checks in for updates, it pulls that XML data, and we basically are returning a custom message through that XML data, letting people know that this is unsupported. The way we did it in Drupal 6, which is probably similar to what we did, is we made the update status think there was a version fix, which automatically tells Drupal 7 that it's insecure, and then the link takes you to a page explaining what's going on. And to clarify that, that's in the admin interface when you're looking at the sort of status report yes. for whether Thank there are you. currently updates available. It's not like the, a public banner on the top of the front of the site. 
<laughs> no, we will not be defacing the public sites. So yeah, it's when you log in within, with, a, with a privilege that lets you see it. It will not just show up on every Drupal site. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, is there any advanced reporting inside of Drupal Steward to know how many requests are being blocked when they are blocked to analyze its value to our websites? That was a very well-worded question. The question was, <laughs> uh, is there advanced reporting within Drupal Steward to talk about how many times requests were blocked, what might have been affected? Basically, can we give you back analytics to say how effective the Drupal Steward program was? Um, we have the raw data to gather that. It has not been added to our dashboard in its current form, but that's a feature request that I think we could probably, pri probably prioritize. And wait, Tim, also, you don't host all of them. Just also to say, like, if it's hosting partners... Uh, yeah, so that, that's an important distinction, right? Yeah. So um, that would be the case for anybody who's just choosing to purchase uh, Drupal Steward through the DA's program directly. If you're with one of the hosting partners who has coverage, who's partnered with us, any reporting would be based on whatever they can offer. So again, currently those partners are Aqua and Pantheon, so it would be you'd have to have a conversation with them about whether they can report on that specifically. Um, but if you're purchasing it directly through the DA service, um, that's a feature we can work on for the dashboard. And you can reach out to me directly, and I'm happy to have more conversations. Uh, let's go here. Yeah, so when you said uh, there is no vendor support, so, so with Drupal 6, there was an extended support program. So is it that there will be no such thing? Correct. Okay. So, and, and so if, um, if an individual or an organization has a patch for a Drupal 7 issue, will they still be able to contribute it uh, to a public Git repository? So let me, let me summarize the question. The question is, will there be extended support like there was for Drupal 6 for Drupal 7? And as of now, there, is no, there are no plans to offer extended support for Drupal 7. And the follow-up question was, if someone has a patch, could they contribute it to a public Git repository? Yes. Uh, it won't be coordinated by the vendor program that used to support it. So anybody can make a Git repository, clone Drupal, push it there, and designate it as that. But they don't get security team support of, here is the repository and you know, vendors vetting those patches. But in North theory, advisory. oh, please go ahead. Nor security advisories or releases from Drupal.org. Right. So no essays, no PSAs, no indication in the update status. But you could still post it to an issue, I suppose, as well for the uh, canonical repos, because those repos will still be there. Okay. And so no one will be committing patches. There, the, the question was, uh, will people be committing these patches? And the answer is no. Okay. Next question. So let me, let me go a little bit towards the back. Uh, you, sir. Uh, I think a I think lot of that content should be, I'm um, sorry, to repeat the question, um, there's a lot of content not just related to Drupal 7, but going earlier to 6 and 5 and things like that. Uh, I think absolutely we'd want to move that to either an archival space, if not remove it, it, it entirely. We just, certainly we would want to make sure that you're not being fed Drupal 7 data when the support you're looking for should be for Drupal 10 or above. So yeah, it's something we'll have to look into. And thank you, Peter, for making sure we repeat the questions. Um, I'm going to go to the very back. I uh, know you, you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the question and was? The, the question was, um, first of all, that people are happy that there is an extension, but wondering what the motivation behind the extension was, given that a lot of, there are still a lot of Drupal 7 sites out there. And I, I guess that just being un, up until now, peop, there hasn't been much extens, a, a incentive for people to actually do those updates since it's still supported. Um, I would say that one of the biggest factors is that it is very time consuming for us to provide Drupal 7 support and it in the past has significantly slowed down the release of security advisories that affect both Drupal 7 and Drupal 10. Um, and I mean to the point like we had, we recently had one that was a coordinated release for Drupal 7, 9 and 10 
that took over a year to resolve with the security team meeting about it every two weeks. So that's the level of technical complexity that it can add to something. And we also are hoping to have overlapping, so this isn't, we haven't decided this for sure yet, but we're hoping to have overlapping major version support again for like Drupal 10 and 11, 11 and 12 and so on, so that you can, so that Drupal 10 support would be extended all the way to the release of Drupal 12 instead of only there being this overlapping year that there's been for the past couple of versions. And there's just no way we can possibly do that with Drupal 7 also being supported. So that was a major factor in deciding this is, this is fine with the time. Also this past year, um, we did finally surpass the mark where there are more Drupal 8 and above sites than Drupal 7 sites. So that's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I will, I will add on to that based on the conversations we've been having. People needed a hard date, and we gave them a hard date, and we're giving them a partnership program to come and get help with their upgrades. And so we're hoping that the combination of the hard date and the combination of the uh, partnership program is motivating people to get off. I don't think, uh, well, yeah, and so that's, yeah. Does that, I assume that answers your question? Um, okay, let's go here because you've had your hand up for a while. Thank you. Uh, this is regarding the partnership program. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm a solo consultant. I'm not mm -hmm. a big agency. I do contribute, but I cannot contribute to the level of large agency to mm -hmm. do that. Um, are there opportunities for a solo consultant like me to partner in migration from Drupal 7 to 10? Uh, that's a great question. So the question was, are there opportunities for solo consultants, sort of the, the freelance level or small consultancies? you know, under 10, something like that, to participate in something like a migration program. Uh, to be honest, I would think many of the like larger scale uh, agencies who might be interested in this probably wouldn't want the deal sizes that are in the smaller side of this range. So I think it would be worthwhile for us to provide opportunities for the small site owners to be connected to the smaller folks. Um, that's worth thinking about. I haven't totally sort of resolved that question in my mind, but I would, I would appreciate a... Uh, uh, if you would reach out to me directly and we can think about that. Thank you. you want the partnership email, which is what I'm trying to find? Uh, sorry, that email again, partnerships at association.drupal.org. I'll leave that up for one more second as people pull up their phones to take pictures of it. Yes. Uh, these slides are going to, yes, we'll, the, the, we'll, we'll attach the slides to the session. I assume we, we can or, do that, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're also going to release our standard public security advisory uh, within the next week that will contain all of this information in not slide form. I, the public service <laughs> announcement, Thank you. It, it, it's, people might not know what's our standard, the public service announcement is the canonical information. These slides are just kind of a preview. Um, so our, our intent is to announce it to the entire world at once. The entire world is not at this DrupalCon, so um, all of the official information will be in that PSA. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Yes. Are the uh, policy changes and when you consider a public and private issue, are those being driven to match upstream best practices that other communities are doing, or are they reflecting a resource constraint that the security team has? And if you had more resources, you'd keep the same policy in place. You're having to work within that. Um, so the question was Are the policy changes around releasing moderately critical? non-mass exploitable issues in line with standard best practices or are they a, re a reflection of resource constraints? And if we had more resources, would we uh, change that policy? And so let me take the second question first. Um, I don't think the answer, I don't think we'd change the policy if we had more resources. Some of these issues are not worth fixing in private. That's not to say they're not bugs. That's not to say they're not security impacting bugs, but the amount of work to fix them in private when they can be fixed in public and will likely get done with more eyes on them is probably worth that trade-off. Um, as far as the resourcing question goes, you know, we'll always take more resources. Uh, give me one second. Uh, if you're interested in joining the security team, uh, this URL unfortunately is gonna redirect you to another URL, but the other URL is too long, so let this URL redirect you. Um, if you're interested in working on the security, if you're interested in joining the security team, we'll always take the resources, but I don't think these are being led entirely by, uh, by, by resource constraints. We are a small team and we are resource constrained like everything else, um, but I don't think 
you know, this has kind of been the practice we've been doing on and off, and this is kind of codifying that practice into public, uh, into uh, available for public consumption. Anybody have anything to add on that? Um, I, I would also add that different organizations and projects have completely varying ranges of what they consider, what they do coordinated disclosure for or not, and there are also organizations and projects that don't practice coordinated disclosure at all. Um, so it's, it, it is kind of up to us. But um, it, I think something that Michael was trying to say that isn't really clear is it's, it's not only a matter of resources for the security team. There are certain kinds of fixes where, like to taking the, the label information disclosure, like we've issued like five or six security advisories for the exact bug in different entity APIs in the past couple of years just for that thing about the label, the title of an unpublished thing being shown to someone who's already a content editor. So it's, it's, it's very low risk, very not a huge issue. And so we had to keep doing all of these one-off changes for different entity types. Um, whereas in public, we can just add an API that handles the label in a safe way and do it once instead of 18 times. The code will be cleaner, it'll take less time and um, probably actually be done faster as well. So. I will say that when we talk with our, our peer open source organizations about what the security team does, most of the time there is just this look of shock on their face because we are we take on a lot more than most of the other organizations do, including all of Contrib Space uh, that have opted into coverage. But most open source projects don't take on Contrib Space the amount we do, and most won't publish things for bugs in which it requires an elevated role to have access to to see the information. Um, obviously, if an elevated role that shouldn't be able to change the information can change the information, that's a different story. But this is, you know, seeing that there's a field that exists even though you don't have access to see the content of the field and you're only seeing the label. Like, there's a lot of things where it's like, oh, that that's a security bug? And yeah, it is, or it was. Um, any other questions, comments, concerns, thoughts? It's very quiet in here. <laughs> Just thanks because y'all have made our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. To repeat um, the thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, thank you, everybody, and uh, see you around the conference. Yeah. Coming up soon, the welcoming reception in the Expo Hall.